All right, folks, here we are moving into unit six, and we're looking at imperialism. This whole unit now is the isms unit. All right, you're looking at imperialism, nationalism, militarism, communism, capitalism, fascism, totalitarianism, totalitarianism all the isms we can get at. But we got to start with imperialism. Imperialism. It's such a hard word when you try to say it so fast. All right, anyway. We're building up here. We've, we've taken our Industrial Revolution. We're moving on to imperialism. We're building towards a modern day in World War I. Okay? And imperialism becomes a big factor. So what is imperialism? It's the seizure of power of a country or territory by another stronger country. Okay? <clears throat> Think of it like Star Wars. It's the Imperial Empire trying to expand and take over the entire galaxy and take it away from the rebels. But in this case, it's taking more and more land. And there's two really big reasons why we're going to take that land. Uh, and, and, well, three if you want to look at it. We're going to expand our country. We're going to make it much bigger and much more powerful. But we're also going to take it for two other reasons. All right. First one is we need new markets to sell our goods. All right. Going into Asia, going into Africa, going into Latin America is going to expand the reach of Europeans and the United States in this matter to a much more world and global market. So it's an economic move. It's also so we can get raw materials. Okay. <clears throat> Think about why colonization happened the first time. You need sugar, tobacco, all right, um, gold, silver, all that stuff is in the colonies, as are many other resources. But as we look here, we're going to add in diamonds. We're going to add in rubber. We're going to add in more gold. We're going to add in salt. All right. That is going to be a big trade. You look at Asia. Opium trade is going to be huge. All right. So we're going for raw materials as well. So where are they going to look towards first? And they're going to look towards Africa. Now, this is a map of Africa in 1914, right on the eve of World War I. If you notice, most of Africa is controlled by European countries. This superiority... Uh, of what the European countries thought they had over the African countries really pushed forward. Ideas like taking uh, the northern parts of Africa because of oil. All right, the European countries are really going to push, and it's going to be a really big movement because of this push um, to World War I because we're going to get into a major conflict over land grabs and decisions that are going to be made by these European countries. So, if you look at it, it's a race by European countries to take control of Africa. And that's why it's called the scramble for Africa. So you need to underline that and highlight that. Because it's the idea that they're all rushing down there very chaotically to grab and have land grabs so they can get their resources. And the more land you have, of course, if you notice in that map, England and France have most control. It's because they were the most powerful countries at the time. Germany is starting to unify. Uh, by 1914, Germany becomes very powerful, hence they are a reason why World War I is going to begin. Uh, of course, of mother, many other reasons that are going to. But the scramble for Africa, the idea that they're all rushing down to take land uh, for themselves. All right. So with this, Europeans also felt they were far more superior. And this is going to be a big issue when we talk about imperialism is this racism that's going to come from it, this superior culture. And it's not just a superior culture mentality, but it's also the national pride mentality. All right. So this is really the next ism that you kind of run across with imperialism is this forcing of nationalism, this national pride in one's country. Um, the Germans feel a certain way about themselves. The French feel a certain way about themselves. The English feel a certain way about themselves. And it's going to carry over into conflict down the road, especially when we get to World War One. One of the main causes of World War I is nationalist pride, and we're going to get to that here as we go along. So make sure you highlight and underline nationalism as one of the main big reasons here that imperialism moves forward, of course, as we go closer to World War I. Now, one nation we need to focus on is Germany. Germany has become unified in 1871, all right, and that's going to be a factor um, or effect from the earlier Congress of Vienna. Uh, Clemens von Metternich, who had kind of brought these countries together uh, in Europe at the Congress of Vienna to avoid conflict, reinstall the monarchies, and also to unify Germany as one powerful country. That was his goal. Now, he's not going to be able to do it, but it's going to set the stage for Germany to be able to do this. So Clemens von Metternich, kind of, he sets it up to move forward. The guy who's actually going to bring the unification together is a man by the name of Otto von Bismarck. Okay, here's a picture of Otto von Bismarck. And again, look at the helmet that is, symbolizes the German army. And he's going to be called the Blood and Iron Chancellor. Obviously, he's going to unite through blood. He's going to do it through war. He is a military man. And the idea of iron is industrialization. He's going to use the mechanization of the weapons that they're going to create to force unification. And it's going to be very successful. Now, as a leader... <clears throat> um, Bismarck is going to institute what is called real politic. And as looking at what the nation needs, 
and basing the politics off of it. And this is going to come into a lot of conflict with the Kaiser because the Kaiser wants control, but Bismarck wants control, and they're going to come into conflict down the road to the point where the Kaiser is actually going to kick Bismarck out. But in saying all that, the people really like what it is, like what Bismarck's doing, because he's pushing the country forward, moving them in a direction that is on par with England, it is on par with France, okay? So this idea of real politic really comes to the forefront. And to do that, he needs a strong army. And that's when every man between 18 and 35 is going to be conscripted in the military. Their job is to protect, expand, annex, do what they need to do for Germany to make it a world stage player. And that's where they're going here. So this is 1871, and by 1914, they are a major player in the world stage. Um, not that Germany hadn't been, this hadn't been unified. That's a big deal. Okay, so now we move into the birth of this German Empire, and what you're going to have is a Kaiser in control, going about, again back to the idea of a monarch, I'll slide over so you can see it, going the idea back to the monarch in control, and a Kaiser is essentially an emperor. If you look at the word Kaiser, Kaiser looks like the word Caesar in <clears throat> from ancient Roman times. It also looks like the word Tsar, and both of these are emperors who had control, whether it be of Rome or of Russia. But the Kaiser is in control, and the Kaiser that's going to come in around World War One is going to be Kaiser Wilhelm, and we'll talk to him about him down the road. All right, and the other thing it's going to institute is what is called the Second Reich, okay, the second major German empire. The first one really starts with the Holy Roman Empire uh, under Charlemagne. It goes for a, a long period of time. Uh, the Second Reich is created under Kaisers, the Kaisers now, and of course von Bismarck uh, bringing the unified Germany together. And of course, the most famous one is the Third Reich under Hitler, where he talks about Germany leading for the next thousand years. It doesn't last that long. I think he gets like 13 years. Um, but needless to say, uh, it's the idea of creating this empire building uh, mentality out of the Germans. All right, so kind of shifting gears, going a little bit more social. Uh, there's a theory that's out there. The theory of evolution is really going to revolutionize the way people look at culture. And the irony of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is it really doesn't have anything to do with what it's going to be used for. But what it's going to do is justify this whole plan that people can look uh, at others in a very racist manner and justify why they are taking their land or their society away. All right, so even though Charles Darwin here, who's going to have the theory of evolution, there's Charles Darwin, uh, talks about naturalism, and of course it's very controversial between whether uh, we evolved or was creationism, not for what we're getting into right now, but understand this idea that one group of people evolved, and that is white European industrialists have evolved so much faster uh, than what they have happened has happened in uh, Africa or parts of Asia. And, you know, Asian, when we look at Chinese and Japanese, whites see Chinese and Japanese at this time kind of on the same level or close to the same level simply because there is a history there between those groups of people and that the Chinese and the Japanese have a long-standing tradition of science, technology, education, whatever the case may be. But Darwin's theory is really a scientific theory, and it's going to be changed and manipulated to meet the needs of imperialists, okay? So, for example, all right, what Charles Darwin says is not necessarily what is going to be put into imperialism. So here, it's taking the theory, justifying what they're doing. The person who's going to do that is a man by the name of Herbert Spencer, and he comes up with the, the term uh, social Darwinism. Now, I put in there survival of the fittest, which is very much tied to the theory of evolution, but in this case, it's more centered around the idea that the country that is the strongest will survive. And it's their job to take other over other land to push themselves forward. And of course, when we get to World War I, and it's this like major brawl between England and France and Germany and the US and Russia, and of course, Russia will pull out, we'll get to that later, uh, and all these countries really vying for a position, it really is who's going to be sur surviving, who's going to last in the long run. And that's kind of where this is going. And of course, it's by more land, more resources, more power, more money, more industrialization. All right, so this is really a racist undertone. And understand, uh, it's justifiable by whites. They, they look at it saying, hey, look, these poor African children, they're children. It doesn't matter if they're grown adults. They're children. They're ignorant. They're half sucking, taken in by the devil. They're, they're sullen children, you know. We've got to do something to fix them. And, of course, as, you know, it's a more of a land grab and resource grab, it's also this idea that, Christianity is going to spread down because if we got to make them Christian, we got to show them Jesus, we got to make them more like us. Of course, they'll never be like us. And that's the mentality. It's a very, very racist undertone to this imperialistic culture. Okay? 
So what Spencer does to justify is he says Europeans are far superior to Africans because they had advanced technology and science. Really what it comes down to is simply you don't bring a spear to a gunfight. All right. If you've ever read the book or plan on reading the book Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, it's an excellent book that really talks about why white European and white European descendants have evolved so rapidly up the chain where natives have not. And it really comes down to the idea that guns separate weaponry, that steel becomes so important because of the industrialization, and that disease, the disease carried from the Europeans to the natives had wiped out the population, uh, and, and the different changes that happened there. It's really an excellent novel, or not an excellent novel, an excellent book that really talks about these ideas, but it's not racist, it's just stating the facts. All right, so social, social Darwinism is also going to look to spread Christianity, like I mentioned earlier. It's not just the idea of land grabs. It's the idea that people are looking at Africans and saying, we need to help them. We need to help. You know, I, I referenced the musical, The King and I. You know, here's an English woman teaching the King of Siam and his family, which is modern-day Thailand, and teaching them English, teaching them Western ways, you know, and just pushing and pushing and pushing um, their belief structure. And Christianity is a big part of it. And that's why a lot of the world changed to Christianity. Of course, Islam now, as you see it move forward, and Islam is really expanding, it's doing the same general idea. It's pushing their religion on others who they believe are not capable of running themselves. All right. Uh, so the idea is that Christianity is a religion of the European country, so it has to be the best. It's very justified in this power superiority mentality of, of European Christians. So, all right. So we push the race for Africa is on. Okay. We're looking to take in Africa. So the countries of Europe are going to get together and they're going to split Africa up. And of course, what they want to avoid is conflict. They want to avoid war with each other. Because you got to remember, a lot of these European countries um, their leaders are related to each other in some way or another, okay? But they still want power, and that's a big, big problem. So they got to figure a way to separate Africa. So what they do is they go to Berlin, and they put a map on the table, and they begin to separate Africa and create boundaries based on power, all right? And that's why France has the most, and England's next, or England has the most, and France is next, and Germany is where they are, in each individual country. But the problem is you're still not going to make people happy because the resources they need may not be necessarily available to them, or they, the ones they want, they're going to have to fight to get, okay? So the whole idea of this Berlin Conference in 1885 is to kind of spread Africa out amongst the European countries for control, but what's going to end up happening is they're going to want more and more and more, and the British and the French and the Germans are all going to start butting heads very hard together, and it's going to lead to conflict, which again is World War I, okay? So here's the map it looks like after the Berlin Conference, and you can see which countries were given which areas based on what they were able to do. Now, if you look here, for example, Ethiopia remained independent, and that's because they're going to be able to fight off the Italians on multiple occasions um, to keep them out. Now, it won't be until Mussolini comes in that Ethiopia will be taken over. Liberia is our um, former American slaves that had gone back to Africa, so they're going to keep their independence as well. But if you notice, the rest of Africa is taken by the European countries, okay? So the other part <clears throat> that really makes this difficult and understand is that they didn't care about ethnic differences. They didn't care about tribal groups that don't, haven't gotten along with each other for thousands of years. They just drew the lines where they want to draw lines and it's going to turn internal conflicts between tribal groups and it's really going to force issues upon the European countries because they're going to have to deal with those issues as well inside of dealing with trying to keep these people down, okay? Um, social Darwinism is also going to force colonies to change in Africa. All right, and the idea of changing them to fit, fit the way the Europeans are is called assimilation. All right, and that's where you encourage them. This is where they learn how to speak your language, is how to dress the way you dress, eat the foods you eat, live and do the customs you do. Think about the British and the British Empire that became so big. Most of the countries that were part of the British Empire still drink tea at midday. Okay, so that's a big part of assimilation. Uh, English spoken French, whatever the case may be. So here are examples for uh, in West Africa, they still speak uh, French. Down in South Africa, they both speak English and Dutch, and there's another language there called Afrikaan, which is a mixture. So that assimilation has happened to force the natives to be like the Europeans. All right. There's also this sense, and of course it's a forced issue, there's also this sense of paternalism. The European countries believed that they had to act as a parent, okay, to the uh, imperialized countries. For example, the British are going to send 1,300 British uh, governors essentially down to India to control 300 million people, all right? A country that had been running itself just fine, now because it's imperialized, has control. But again, it's the weaponry, it's the industrialization that makes a big, big difference. 
All right. So the other thing is we're looking to angle for access to areas, and a big part of that is what's called geopolitics. That's the angling for access, and a major, major part of that is the Suez Canal. We're talking about trade and access to ports of East Africa and Asia. This becomes a major hotbed of contention as we move along. All right, next video will be about China.